second to last panel, which is titled American Journeys. Um, the, some of these students were in a um, history methods class, and one was in a senior seminar, and with the theme being travel, travel literature. One reason I like that theme is because uh, there's a lot of methodological stuff around that, about ways to interpret it and analyze it. And one really interesting thing is it can be taken in so many different directions. And I think we get to see that on full display today with papers um, touching on different ways of analyzing and thinking about that literature. And we start with Scott Beeman um, and his paper titled Overcoming the Ice, a Comparative Analysis of the 19th Century's Hunt for the Northwest Passage. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome, and welcome to all our guests as well. Um, as Dr. Weiner said, my name is Scott Beeman, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about the research that I did into the hunt for the Northwest Passage, primarily focusing on the 19th and very early 20th century. Um, for those who might not be aware, the term Northwest Passage refers to what was initially a mostly theoretical naval route uh, through the ice fields and frozen tundra of what is now northern Canada. Uh, really up until the modern era, this theoretical passage was exactly that. It was theoretical. Um, nobody in the Western world, at least, knew if it was actually possible to travel by boat um, through that region on their maps. Um, and any attempt, even by Europe's best explorers, to try to find a way through it had been extremely dangerous and unsuccessful. However, there were a couple voyages that did make it through from one side of the continent to the other. The research that I did was essentially seeking to answer a pretty simple question. If all of these voyages took place in the same harsh environment, the same conditions, why did some of these voyages end so poorly as you would expect, but why did some of them succeed in navigating that same environment? Um, it's a simple question with a very complicated answer, of course, uh, but I managed to trim down 37 pages into 10 minutes. Hopefully that will express it properly. Um, so to try to answer it, I read through journals, ship records, some other writings by four different men who were in charge of four different expeditions. These men were William Edward Perry, John Franklin, Robert McClure, and Roald Amundsen. Two of these men, the latter two in that group, led what could be considered successful voyages. The other two, the former two men, led unsuccessful trips, with Franklin's ending much, much more tragically than the rest. In my research, I identified three main factors that I think contributed to the overall failure or success of each expedition. Essentially, the way that each explorer dealt with these factors uh, more or less determined their success. Those factors are First, the type of travel that each explorer actually engaged in was a really big factor. Second, the logistical strategies that they employed and the preparation that they undertook for these journeys was also very important. And finally, the different technologies that were available to each trip and sort of the ways that they utilized them also made a really huge impact. In all four cases, they at least began their journeys on boats. William, Ed William Perry and John Franklin's voyages both involved the use of two massive warships each. Um, these massive ships provided various benefits, such as being really durable against the floating chunks of ice that they would encounter. However, these huge ships also came with a downside by their very nature, which is that they were huge. And that meant that they could really only move if there were really big gaps in the ice. Um, and so if there weren't really big gaps in the ice, they just kind of had to sit there and most of the time would also get frozen into the ice, um, oftentimes for years at a time without moving. So at that point, they'd essentially just be at the mercy of a spring thaw to sort of get them out and hopefully allow them to progress. But sometimes that spring thaw would come and either they wouldn't get out of the ice or it still wouldn't actually open up a big enough gap for them to get through it. Um, 
In the journeys of McClure and Amundsen, however, each man alongside their crews was able to sort of alleviate this obstacle in sort of different ways. McClure's expedition began on a large ship, much like Perry and Franklin's, but he was much more willing to sort of abandon it when it seemed like they were not ever going to get unstuck from the ice. And both his and Amundsen's journeys saw the use of sled teams to sort of try to find routes, essentially like scouting missions, um, to try to find routes through the ice. And then McClure eventually just completely abandoned the ship and they set off on foot on using sleds to sort of transport their supplies. Amundsen, though, never needed to actually abandon his ship because the one that he came on was much smaller. Him and his crew took an old Norwegian fishing vessel instead of a warship. It was tiny in comparison to Perry, Franklin, and McClure's ships, and it being smaller meant that it also had some drawbacks, such as a lower capacity for storage of supplies. But it being smaller meant that it was capable of navigating much slimmer and shallower passages of water. So this meant in situations where those earlier voyages might have gotten stuck, Amundsen's crew was often able to still just find routes through the water and sort of go through the shallower water that those heavier ships couldn't. Um, but both in McClure and, Mc and Amundsen's cases, their use of sled teams to sort of aid in their navigation and to finish the trip in McClure's case, uh, it was a hugely influential factor, basically, determining their success. When it comes to their preparation and logistics, Perry and McClure, despite one being deemed as a failure and one as a success, were sort of similar to each other. Both of them saw lavish, well-preserved su well supplies, along with some leafy plants that they were able to grow on the ships to sort of ward off scurvy. McClure and his crew, especially after they abandoned their ship, were able to supplement their provisions with fresh game a lot more, which would also help to save off scurvy. However, if you look at Amundsen and Franklin's journeys, there was a much more stark difference that can be seen between the successful and the unsuccessful sort of groups here. Perry and McClure found success by bringing tons of well-preserved food with them that lasted their entire journeys. However, the benefit of Amundsen's smaller boat and therefore much smaller crew is that they could rely on hunting to supply their journey, essentially. Um, it's less mouths to feed, so you don't have to catch as much, you know, as much deer and, and, and whatnot. Um, so, the, so the lower amount of storage to actually bring food wasn't as much of a drawback as it would kind of sound like. Um, so essentially, they were able to just procure as much food as they needed um, any time they were able to hunt. And on the days where they couldn't hunt, they still had enough room to bring enough provisions to sort of get themselves through it. Franklin's journey saw what is essentially a combination of all of the negative factors of each other explorer. Um, he had a gigantic crew that was well over 100 men, which would be far too large to sustain just by hunting. So Franklin's only choice really was to go into the Arctic, much like Perry and McClure did, by just loading themselves up with supplies. However, planning his voyage was sort of a last-minute thing, which seems like a bad idea. Uh, and the tin cans that they brought with them were really poorly sealed, so much of their food spoiled really fast, and they just ran out of food. Moreover, because the marvels of 19th century medicine didn't really recognize lead as something you don't want to eat, the cans were sealed with lead. It was done really poorly. So some historians have posited that since the crew members were essentially feeding themselves two kinds of poison in this case, that might have attributed to all 134 disappearing. Um, Perry, before Franklin, showed that sustaining a big crew was possible, but the hurried nature of their preparation meant that once they were stuck, it was really only a matter of time before that rush preparation began to haunt them. Amundsen's journey, different from all the others based on the size of the crew, could utilize a completely different tactic and benefited greatly from it. The technology available to Perry, Franklin, and McClure was relatively similar overall, but the application of the technology in each journey was fairly different. One big difference, though, from Perry's voyage is that engines hadn't really been advanced enough for him to actually fit one on his ship, so his crew had to completely rely on, on currents and, just, and, and wind currents to sort of get them through the Arctic unsuccessfully. Franklin and McClure's ships both had steam engines on them, which could help propel them deeper into the ice fields when the winds died down. However, they were also really unwieldy, gigantic devices that ate up thousands of pounds of coal to operate across their entire trip and often broke down. Amundsen, with his voyage taking place just after the turn of the 20th century, had more advanced technology available to him and his crew, and their small boat was equipped with a little diesel engine. That meant that the engine was lighter, 
the fuel was lighter, and any time it would break down, it was normally a little bit simpler to fix. So this was the major technological advantage that Amundsen had, and it did help his crew a lot. Overall, the journeys of Perry and Franklin could be viewed as something of a precedent that were set for McClure and Amundsen to try to model after and improve upon in the end. McClure and Amundsen found themselves up against the same frigid environs and hostile elements which had imprisoned Perry and murdered Franklin, but both managed to succeed in the face of it. These two voyages, different yet similar as they are, both represented improvements on the models of Perry and Franklin, with Amundsen nearly perfecting those models. Additionally, these voyages serve as a sort of representation of the importance of learning about and interpreting historical events. McClure and Amundsen learned from their past to prepare for their future, uh, and Perry and Franklin, more or less, they studied history, but they didn't really take the right lessons away with it. Um, and without their failures, Perry and, 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 uh, and Franklin, McClure and Amundsen might have simply just met with the same fate. In doing this research, I found the stories of Perry, Franklin, McClure, and Amundsen fascinating, uh, and I hope you all feel the same. Thank you all very much for your time. Thanks for that great paper, Scott. Next up, Gideon Frum. His paper is entitled, The Mind's Wilderness, Teddy Roosevelt's Journey to the River of Death. This is The Mind's Wilderness, Teddy Roosevelt's Journey to the River of Doubt. Theodore Roosevelt was a true American man who embodied the image of a cowboy. He helped embody the image of the American man who went to Harvard University and formed the image of a cowboy. Apologies. Theodore Roosevelt was, I'm sorry. Theodore Roosevelt was a true American man who embodied the image of the American dream. He was an academic who studied at Harvard University as well as an outdoorsman who helped finish fashion the image of a cowboy. He lived an exciting life filled with many challenges and adventures, and the river doubt was just one of the many challenges that makes his legacy what it is today. The expedition of the river doubt was a scientific expedition conducted in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, which Roosevelt went on the latter years of his life. It took place between the years of 1913 and 1914, and it was a perilous journey where Roosevelt would almost lose his life. This journey had jagged, jagged rapids, dangerous animals, and illnesses such as malaria. So why did he take this risk, and why did he go on this journey? The Brazilian government gave Roosevelt the opportunity to take this journey and heal from his mental state after personal loss. This purpose of the journey was for, sci for science, but he used it to heal his mental state. Roosevelt dealt with hardship, but he did not express it. His history displays a pattern where he runs to nature for mental rejuvenation after depression and hardship. Nature is how Roosevelt expresses himself. We don't see how he deals with grief in his writings, but we see how he does it through his actions. So in to order to understand Theodore Roosevelt's actions and motives for this journey, we need to understand his history. Ever since his early childhood, Roosevelt loved nature. He developed this love for nature while he was battling chronic asthma, as nature helped get his mind off of his illness. He would collect snakes, frogs, mice, and insects, and more for what he called the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History, which he kept in his bedroom. This asthma plagued him ever since his birth in 1858, but he came healthier as he sought to strengthen himself in order to participate in outdoor activities. In August of 1871, Roosevelt went on a month-long camping trip, and this was the longest period of good health he had ever seen in his youth. You, Roosevelt used nature in order to combat his childhood struggle. Theodore, also, uh, Theodore Roosevelt also used nature to describe and escape the grief of loss in his life. In 1878, while he was studying at Harvard, Roosevelt's father died. To deal with the grief, Roosevelt went into nature, he exerted himself by riding his horse nonstop in trails. He also pushed himself by rowing his boat across Long Island Sound. 
In 1880, Roosevelt married Alice Leaf. At the same time, Roosevelt's political career was taken off as he was elected into the State Assembly of New York. On February 14, 1884, tragedy struck. A kidney disease has taken Alice's life. Roosevelt's mother was also suffering with typhoid and died the same evening. This pain was immeasurable for Roosevelt, and he marked a large X in his journal entry for that day and stated, the light has gone out from my life. Roosevelt was suffering, so he ran back to nature. And from 1884 to 1886, Roosevelt traveled deep into North Dakota and became a cattle rancher. This experience sparked a new man, a man who led the Rough Riders into the Spanish-American War and a man who became the 26th president of the United States. Theodore Roosevelt was president of the United States from 1901 to 1909. He loved being in office and said he probably enjoyed it more than any other president. Theodore Roosevelt conceded the presidency to William Taft in 1909. After leaving the White House, Roosevelt traveled immediately to Africa for another scientific expedition, continuing the pattern of running to nature. Afterward, Roosevelt traveled through Europe and then in 1910 returned to the United States. However, Roosevelt's disapproval of Taft's policies led him to run for a third term in 1912. Despite his best efforts, Roosevelt lost this election and faced great and utter disappointment. Roosevelt faced many griefs many times before, but the loss of the 1912 election felt to him as if he was being rejected by the American people. He could not handle the reality of this loss, as the disappointment and embarrassment served as a new source of depression. Roosevelt needed to heal from this pain the only way he knew how. He needed to travel back to nature. The opportunity to escape to nature presented itself when Roosevelt was invited to give lectures in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil in 1913. He expressed his interest in exploring the Amazon, and the Brazilian government commissioned such a journey. They also commissioned Brazilian explorer Candido Rondon to accompany him. The mission was to explore the River of Doubt. The journey began with 19 men in December of 1913, and the expedition of the uncharted River of Doubt started in February 1914. The practical purposes of this expedition was science, and to also chart the river and collect any specimens found. But this supported the credibility of the trip, but Roosevelt organized it all to cure his depression. Roosevelt was meticulous when it came to his writing, but he seldom wrote about his feelings. This is apparent in his book, Through the Brazilian Wilderness, where he stated his primary concern was science. But his actions show that he was looking for another opportunity to cope with his grief in the outdoors. Roosevelt used science to disguise his primary concern his pain. In the Amazon rainforest, Roosevelt no longer had to worry about what the world thought of him. Instead, he studied nature. He was able to focus on the outward journey exploring the river while also looking at the inward journey taking place. After about a month, Roosevelt was able to heal mentally from the defeat of the election, and he spent his time hunting animals and working hard physically. Having worked through most of his grief, Roosevelt wanted to finish the expedition as soon as possible in order to voice his opinions on the global political tension taking place in early 1914. Roosevelt's impatience suggested that he achieved peace and once again regained a healthy mental state, meaning he was ready to end the trip and disregard the minute details of scientific research. March 2nd, 1914 started a series of difficulties. The River of Doubt was filled with many jagged rapids which forced the journey to take place dragging their canoes on the riverbank. The constant traveling on land meant the party used more of their rations in a shorter span of time. The most dangerous part about this land travel? The mosquitoes. The mosquito bites left the party in a constant state of malaria. It was almost as if they were taking turns back and forth with who had malaria at any given time. No one caught it as bad as Roosevelt. Roosevelt's health worsened because, as Roosevelt's health worsened, he became less concerned with the scientific purposes. His illness grew so bad that he needed to be dragged in a canoe while others were relying on him while he was dependent on others. His dependency on others caused him to also dive into depression and he almost considered taking his life. Roosevelt's fever fortunately broke on April 5th as the group was able to press on. The party came in contact with some rubber trappers who were native in the area and they pointed them in a the direction which had fewer rapids. Roosevelt's state of mind improved as there seemed to be a light at the end of the tunnel. 
On April 26th, the exploration of the River Doubt came to an end as the party reached the city of Manaus. Roosevelt lost 57 pounds as he and Rondon mapped over 1,500 miles of the uncharted river. This grueling, dangerous, and physically demanding journey took a toll on Roosevelt, which would, he never f would fully recover. But it gave him the pride and mental stability he so desperately sought. Roosevelt felt vindicated that he was still able to do something great with his life. Theodore Roosevelt lived a fascinating and impactful life filled with many successes and losses, from his weak childhood to the loss of his father and his mother, his beloved wife, and the loss of the 1912 election. Roosevelt always sought peace from nature. Roosevelt didn't like to share his pain, and therefore it was imperative for him to find an outlet. Roosevelt's expedition was a scientific one, but that was not his purpose. He wrote in scientific means because he didn't want to convey he might be depressed. He wrote in this manner his whole life, and it reflected what feelings were hidden behind the American man who only allowed nature to hear what was truly on his mind. Roosevelt traveled into the River of Doubt to heal mentally, just like he had traveled into nature many times before. Roosevelt needed peace after the failed election, and so he traveled through the Brazilian wilderness in order to escape his mind's wilderness. Uh, last but not least, we are finishing with Ben Burkle in his paper, Finding Amalgam in Search of Traveler Bill Bryson's Perfect um, American Path. Kind of a futuristic piece that works with our all right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Burkle, and my research is based on finding Bill Bryson's perfect American town. So everyone loves a good road trip. Driving across this vast country with snacks in the backseat and music to listen to is just something that's quintessentially American. We've all done it. And while we do get tired of being in the car by the end, we know that we've been somewhere new and done something very exciting. However, best-selling author Bill Bryson flipped the stereotypical road trip on its head in his 1989 novel, The Lost Continent, Travels in Small Town America. In this book, Bryson details a months-long journey through various small towns that he deemed to be soulless, to be ordinary, or to be dull. He avoided places that were um, soulless tourist traps. But first, a little biography on Bryson. He was born in Des Moines, Iowa, and then moved to Great Britain in young adulthood. And he remains there with his wife and children today. His writing style is witty and sarcastic. He's also very descriptive in his writing, but he's also very judgmental. Lots of his literature revolves around the themes of travel and exploration. And honestly, it could be said that Bryson is the anti-tourist. He's a true traveler. And in the study of travel literature, there is a difference in between what constitutes a traveler and what constitutes a tourist. A tourist takes the same vacation as everybody else. Same path, just looking for a fun trip. A traveler forges their own path. Their journey has emotional and intellectual depth. They're looking for a new and invigorating experience. So of course, being the traveler that Bryson is, his cross-country road trip did have an intellectual purpose. He was searching for the perfect American town. He named this fictional community Amalgam, as he said he was searching for an amalgam of all the beautiful places he had read about in fiction. But I'll spoil the end of the novel for you. He never found it. He never found Amalgam, which, you know, is quite the bummer, because he took months traversing the country looking for something that he w wanted so desperately, and he never found it. So I thought, well, if Amalgam didn't exist in, in 1989 when Bryson wrote this novel, maybe it exists today. Throughout The Lost Continent, Bryson commented on every little thing that he liked or disliked about the dozens of communities that he went through. And so I took that criteria, applied it to various small towns today to see if Amalgam exists as Bryson would see it in today's world. But first, in order to find out if Amalgam exists today, we must first specify his criteria. And let's start with what he liked. Um, so Bryson really likes a place that has a rich community and a rich history because all the citizens are united around one common identity. He also likes places that are pedestrian friendly um, with beautiful architecture and lots of green space. 
In addition, he loves a good city square. Uh, throughout his travels, Bryson often stops at homestyle American restaurants and classic diners. And you know the type. Yeah, they're not the pinnacle of fine dining, but the food is good, they have a good community, and they have a good heart. Additionally, Amalgam would be highly educated and have good schools. And throughout his novel, Bryson comments on college towns tremendously, not only because they're highly educated, but because they tend to have a sense of community, they tend to have lots of green space, and they tend to have really interesting architecture. Lastly, Amalgam would be close to natural wonders, whether that be a river, mountain, um, forest, beach, what have you. Now on to the dislikes. Bryson does not like a community that is too hoity-toity. Amalgam would be for everyone, not just the wealthy. Everything else that Bryson disliked about the various small towns he went through basically go hand in hand. He absolutely hated communities that had an omnipresence of cars and an over-reliance on chain stores and restaurants. And to see how chains and cars plague American communities, we can actually see that today. I mean, take a trip down I-69 to Indianapolis, take any exit ramp, it does not matter which one, and you will see exactly this. You'll see a McDonald's, and then you'll see a Marathon gas station and a Super 8 motel, and then you'll see another McDonald's, and then a Dollar General, a Subway, and then lastly, a third McDonald's, and then you'll get to the city square. But the windows are boarded up and the sidewalks are cracked because who needs a walkable and community-oriented city square when you can just drive to three separate McDonald's? <laughs> so car culture communicates to suburban sprawl and urban <coughs> decay. Um, Bryson noticed that in 1989. We noticed it today. So now that we know what Bryson disliked and liked about the various small towns he went to, we can apply it to certain towns in 2024. And the first one I found was Timnath, Colorado. Um, so Timnath um, is, has a quaint main street lined with trees, flowers, and small businesses that you can walk to. It has plentiful green space, and it's within a short drive to the Rocky Mountains and the mid-sized city of Fort Collins, which is great because res residents of Timnath can take advantage of both without having to worry about the issues that tourist destinations and cities face. However, Timnath isn't perfect. And why is that? Well, Bryson would say it's because they built a Costco right next to the interstate. You see, due to um, the, uh, the addition of chains oh. outside of the urban center, Timnath is vulnerable to suburban sprawl and the loss of local businesses. People will be drawn away from the center and towards the outskirts of town. Therefore, Timnath, despite its redeemable qualities, it really can't be um, considered a candidate for Bryson's perfect amalgam in his eyes. Our second candidate for Amalgam is Vineyard, Utah, um, with a modern hip food scene and luxury shopping centers. And it's also named Utah City, which in itself is something that Bryson would enjoy. Yeah, the name is a bit basic, but it shows that residents of Vineyard are united around their Utah and culture. Um, it is additionally uh, has a lake shore along Utah Lake, and it's not the great Salt Lake, which the state is famed for, but it still provides for a touch of nature that you can walk along. However, the modern food scene that Vineyard is constructing really is not something that Bryson would like, interestingly enough. Remember, he likes homestyle diners that make you feel like you're back in your family's kitchen. Now think about the typical hip modern restaurant. Sure, the food is good and the menu is unique, but they always seem to sell a, a version of a grilled cheese for like $20 and tacos for like $30. So there's no soul there and there's no community. Bryson would additionally say that uh, Vineyard caters too much to the wealthy in general. Sure, the lakeside condos and the luxury shopping centers are nice, but they're not accessible to everyone. Therefore, we really can't consider Vineyard to be the perfect American town either. And our final candidate for Amalgam is Millville, Delaware, which is just a mile away from the Atlantic Ocean. And like our previous two candidates, you can walk just about anywhere. It also has highly rated public schools, some of the best in the state, which Bryson would adore because he loves a well-educated community. And in terms of community, Millville certainly has a great one. Um, in fact, locals in this town can trace their ancestry back to the same exact town all the way back to the Revolutionary War. So Millville has a rich history and Bryson would adore that. However, one strike is that um, Millville really does not have a town square. It's basically just a strip mall with a sea of a parking lot around it. Um, and the bottom right corner, that is their town center. Uh, and as you see, there's a Petco, there's a grocery store, and there's a subway. 
Imagine going downtown and the best thing that you can do is go buy groceries. So therefore, we really can't consider Millville to be Bryson's 100% perfect amalgam either. So even though Bryson carefully laid out what makes a perfect town in the lost continent, it seems as if there still isn't an American community that fits all of his intricate criteria. While some of Bryson's um, opinions were quite valid, um, such as our over reliance on cars, others are arbitrary and only exist because he's just a very judgmental individual. Um, so that's not necessarily a failing of the American small town. And Amalga may never truly exist the way Bryson sees it. Nonetheless, there are communities such as Vineyard, such as Millville, and such as Timnath that are working hard to become fantastic places to live. These communities are un unique and prosperous while also keeping true to the everybody knows everybody facet of small town life. And that progress seen throughout small town America demonstrates anything but a lost continent. Thank you. Why don't we open it up for questions? Okay, I see Professor Fitzpatrick and I see that. Thank you. I have a um, question for Gideon. Um, I wanted to ask if you could expand a little bit on something that you talked about um, specifically um, during Roosevelt's, uh, the actual exposition itself uh, down the River of Doubt. You talked about um, you know, how Roosevelt becomes really sick, he becomes really ill. Um, he's, you said he loses, what, 56 pounds? 57. 57. That's a lot. <laughs> I wish I could lose 57 pounds. <laughs> um, but he... Um, you, you make a strong case uh, that he kind of retreats into the wilderness to really overcome some of his emotional problems, some of his emotional challenges and difficulties. Um, how does, you know, um, falling ill, you know, it seems like he almost dies, you know, this kind of physical weakness during the, you know, act of trying to escape and to, to recuperate uh, mentally and emotionally, you know, how does this weigh on him and how does this kind of impact his, his journey, you know, his emotional journey down the trail? Yeah. So... In this aspect, Roosevelt was still focused on his own journey and making sure to rejuvenate his mental state. And so when this sickness came down upon him, it just further did away with the scientific aspects of it. And so when he was going through such a bad sickness, uh, actually, he also had an infection on his leg because he was trying to save a capsized canoe and he cut his leg on a rock. And so he was dealing with this infection and this very bad malaria. And so all of this was weighing down on him. Like I said, he almost wanted to take his life because he hated being dependent on others. And so when Roosevelt is getting out of that and starting to feel better, he's more thinking of what he's accomplished. Like he's definitely the type of character that when he goes through something, he's excited when he gets out of it because then he can be, oh, look what I did. And so it's, I said more validation to his own character because to him there was such a downward spiral after president like he can't really top being president and so he didn't just want the rest of his life to just be nothing and so this was kind of his way of proving that he could still do something great especially in the physical aspect of it like he was getting older he, he died young I think in his 60s but still, that's something very strenuous to be able to do and overcome. Thank you. Um, my, my question is for Gideon. I knew about the expeditions and exotic hunting, but I didn't know about Roosevelt's interest in science. What were his particular interests and among his many other accomplishments, did he happen to contribute in any important way to scientific endeavors? So I don't think he had any actual contributions to science. But he was, for, he was specifically interested in like zoology and geography, hence why he wanted to travel and do different, uh, go to different places. And in those different places were many different animals and everything he didn't want to see or did want to see. Because, you know, you live in the era without Google, you can't just type up an image of what an elephant looks like. He wanted to go experience this for himself. And so him going into nature is how he really enjoyed the scientific aspect of it. When he was little, outside of his house on the beachfront, there was a washed up dead seal. And he went there, out there every single day to watch it decay so he could record in his book all the details about it. And so when I talk about his writings and writing in a scientific manner, he would say what 
what stage this is, what kind of bird it is. He studied the Latin terminology for every single different kind of animal. And so whenever he would go out into nature, he wouldn't say, oh, here's a blackbird. He would say the Latin term for it. And so he, he was just engrossed in this thinking of the scientific aspect. Uh, he didn't contribute very much scientific research, but he did lay out a lot of uh, manuscripts and books about different areas he explored that allowed others to get an idea for what kind of scientific or zoology is out there. So one thing I noticed, um, and I probably all did in uh, all three of your papers, is this idea of journeys and travel um, as, as, you know, this, this notion of sort of discovery, but also doubt and this idea of trying to figure out things, figure out things about yourself, um, about, you know, the nature of the Northwest Passage, about is there an ideal American town? And I wonder if you could all speak a little bit to this notion of, um, you know, what you learned in your research about journeys and travel and um, how that kind of fit with doubt and discovery for the people who were um, undertaking these various journeys. Uh, I could go. Oh, go ahead. Um, at least in my case, uh, because like most of what sort of informed my paper was just journals essentially. And so I got sort of a pretty good view of how those captains at least kind of saw everything as going. Um, Except for Franklin, because we don't have anything from him, because you know, he didn't do very well. I would imagine he wasn't happy about it. Probably had some doubts. Um, that's my histor that's my historian's idea. Um, but yeah, like I think there were different points, especially like with Perry, because they had to eventually just turn around. Where yeah, they sort of expressed that sort of sense of doubt and, and didn't know. I mean, again, in his case, they got stuck in the ice for like two and a half years at one point, and that would sort of weigh on you a little bit. Um, it was also kind of interesting too, sort of seeing how some of those, uh, how some of those journeys dealt with, I guess, sort of a psychological element or kind of combated like, sort of like, I guess you would consider it like depression and stuff like that. Because in that area of the world, there were periods where you didn't see the sun for days at a time. And so, I mean, I know in Perry's case, I think they had two different newspapers that they published on the ships. Just, I don't know what they would have talked about other than <laughs> like, we found a new piece of ice floating today or something, I don't know. Um, but that was sort of, and they had like daily exercise routines that they did to sort of just keep people occupied while they just sat there. Um, I mean, in Amundsen's case, they didn't do a ton of that because they were just, they never really had to stop for a serious amount of time, but like, it was kind of interesting to sort of learn about, I mean, to see the doubts that those guys had, but also sort of, I guess, the way that they tried to combat them in different ways. In Roosevelt's aspect, it's pretty simple. Uh, Roosevelt was a very hands-on person, so he wanted to take charge of every situation. Um, and so his area of doubt is when he's not doing something. And that really took place of when he was being dragged in a canoe by the party is like he just couldn't do anything. He physically couldn't even sit up. Um, his aspect of doing something was doubting his own ability and allowing others to take charge of the situation. Like he gave up his rations while he was in the canoe because he was like, other people are dragging me, they need the food. And when he was contemplating his own life, well that was because he didn't want people expending their own resources to take care of him. And so that was really, the only area of doubt in his mind um, at that time, because whenever he's doing something, he always has the attitude that it's going to end well for him and it's going to be a success. Um, I guess uh, when reading The Lost Continent, you can kind of feel that Bryson doubts that Amalgam exists. Um, and I think that's probably because his tone is just very pessimistic. I think he's just pessimistic in nature. Um, but also, I think he doubted its, its existence because he was too idealistic. Um, and actually at the end of the book, he kind of reflects on that a little bit. And he says, and at the end of the book, he returns home to Des Moines, um, which he constantly just like talks bad about during the whole book. But at the end he returns and he's like, wait, it's not that bad. This sort of is like amalgam, even though it's still not perfect. Um, and I think so, 
Bryson doubted throughout most of the novel that it existed because he thought nothing could be as perfect as what he dreamt up in his mind. But towards the end, he realizes that reality can't be perfect and that there are some places that may exist that could be close to his idealistic vision. Mine wasn't so much a question as it was kind of an observation to answer uh, Beth and, and you. Roosevelt, after 1898, was constantly going back up that hill. And, and when, when he gets malaria, which is nothing to play with at all, uh, he, uh, it was like part of, because I've, I've read a little bit about this, that, that his, uh, his recovery was again, you know, once he got out of that doubt or being dragged around, it was, here's another hill to go up. And that's, that's just so gross about Oh, it absolutely yeah. is. Uh, once they got towards a less, um, or I have to rephrase, once they got towards a safer area of the river with less rapids, and they just started actually getting going again, because they were making up to 100 stops a day oh, yeah. trying to measure the actual river, because yeah. cartography was really just extensive. Yeah. And so once they actually got going, then it was really, you know, it gets the ball rolling, and it's getting excited again. Yeah. 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 Okay. Other questions? Do, do, may I can ask oh. more? Oh, we have another one? Sorry. Oh, great. I, I saw Jenna. Was there somebody on the side? Okay. I'm Otto Dork. Um, <laughs> but while I'm doing that, I'm going to use my power to put the microphone. Um, <laughs> to ask a very micro question of Scott. You were talking about the lead that was being fused into the food. Um, yeah. You made me think of Emily's paper. Is there any chance that the lead was there for um, medicinal purposes? Um, or are we assuming it was purely accidental? Uh, I think it was purely accidental in this case, just because, I mean, saying an accident almost makes it sound like they didn't mean to poison themselves necessarily, but they still thought it was safe to like seal their food with it. So even if they did it well and the food kept longer, then congratulations, that's one poison instead of both of them. So like, I mean, it's just, it's just medical science at the time. They just had no idea. And, and I mean, there was a lot of problems with Franklin's expedition, and it ended extremely poorly. There are uh, kind of, I guess, archaeological records that found some of the skeletons of the crew that had scraping on the bone as though they had to eat each other, yeah. which is pretty pleasant. Um, so I guess that's just one of the many things that they... Uh, either didn't know would be a problem or just, I mean, kind of scrimped on the preparation, I guess, but yeah. I thought maybe it was preventative, um, just, just yeah. in case. Unfortunately, in their case, no. <laughs> Sorry, uh, McKenna? Um, my, my question, question is more towards uh, Ben and how you were looking at like, diff like what the ideal American town is and how kind of he always thought that the, the grass is greener on the other side. Um, did you ever look at like built American towns with the purpose of being a utopia? Like here in Indiana, what's that one town that everybody knows? New Harmony. New Harmony. <laughs> New Harmony, Indiana. <laughs> Carrie. Um, New Harmony, Indiana. Did you look at any of those like built cities in, in uh, aspect to find that amalgam in American culture? Actually, I, I didn't. That would be great for some future research to see if like there are people who go out to try to create the best destination possible. Um, but I did find some other communities that weren't listed that were even like, like the three that I listed were the cream of the crop. Um, but there are some that sort of were built um, that were had some facets of what Bryson liked, but for the most part, they were not so great. Um, and one of those was, funnily enough, called Iowa City, and it was in Texas. Um, and that was sort of settled by people from Iowa, so it was just like people moved, and then they created a place there. So I don't know if they were trying to build a utopia there, or if they were just mass, mi mass migrating from one state to the other. Um, but I guess that's the closest of what I could think of, something like that. Um, Dr. Lynn. 
would get the harmonists weren't looking for uh, fancy restaurants either. <laughs> uh, this is primary. It's not it's, a. It's, 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 it's uh, not um, I guess this is primarily for Scott, but maybe a bit for, for Gideon as well. Um, what uh, I'd like to hear a bit more about whether any um, of the expeditions, especially the later ones, uh, thought about contacting indigenous people to, you know, you people who live here, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, where we're headed? I, I imagine I know the answer to that. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it seems like, especially later expeditions, uh, especially given that you know the searchers, I'm presuming for Franklin, I vaguely remember them encountering Inuit people who were like, yeah, we saw some starving, crazy white people <laughs> disappearing all over the horizon. You, you would think that they would you know, get, get a bit of advice from the locals uh, as they went. Is there any evidence of, of any attempts in either your, of your cases to, uh, you know, tap into some local knowledge? So, uh, yeah, so like you said, in sort of the, like the search for Franklin, which Robert McClure's expedition initially sort of started as just looking for Franklin and then they ended up kind of accidentally finishing the journey. Um, I didn't, I mean, I talked about it in the paper a little bit, but just, cut it for time basically, but they brought along, I think he was a Jesuit priest who had like lived with Inuit people for a time and he had, like he knew their language and everything and he had really good relations with them. And so from what I read, sort of their contacts that they had, they didn't have a ton of contacts with, with uh, native people, but the contacts they had were all really positive, uh, which I mean, like you sort of alluded to, is a nice thing to read <laughs> from the genre. Um, and, you know, mostly in, his, in their case, like, it was mostly just a trade for new coats if, if some of their coats got ruined or for supplies or things like that. And, yeah, they did use some of them as kind of information brokers, so to speak. Um, as far as the rest of them, though, I mean, again, Franklin, we don't necessarily know. Perry, from what I understand, they encountered... Uh, uh, Inuits, but they, again, it wasn't, you know, part of their central strategy or anything. They just sort of were both in the same area at the same time, I guess. Um, they weren't negative experiences, which is good. Um, and then Amundsen, again, also wasn't, uh, like, I think that they had more sort of, I guess, run-ins with them, but again, they were all fairly cordial and, and didn't, thankfully, none of the groups, it seemed like, with the Inuits for any dumb reason or whatever, but, um, but yeah, so I think for McClure's though, McClure's expedition definitely, and I think because of the nature of it as sort of this information gathering expedition initially, probably made, I guess, a bit more sense to try to have somebody who could actually speak their language, and they had a lot of actual positive interaction with Native populations. I kind of want to touch on that question a little bit, because I really like that question. Um, there was definitely contact with some natives in the area. Uh, like I said, they came in contact with rubber trappers who they lived there their whole lives. That's why they knew some of the areas of the river. Um, one of the interesting parts about it, because I think the actual expedition of the river is so fascinating because there are a lot of really dangerous things that happen. Um, while they were traveling on the riverbank, there was constant threat of natives trying to kill them. Um, there's one instance, there was a dog who was with the party and the dog got shot by an arrow while they were trying to target, I think it was Rondon. And so that's, just being on the riverbank was such a bad thing for the party, especially because they would hear like the kind of communication. It wasn't speaking, it was more like bird chirping, but they could hear just constantly through the night these natives. And so they uh, would form parties around the riverbank, they would have a fire and just kind of set up a guard around, and they had constant night watch because the natives were trying to get them. <coughs> I wonder if you wanted to ask a well, question. Maybe we're, I don't know, maybe. As a last wrap up, is it on the map? <laughs> 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 no, I think we'll, I mean, okay, so I started off the conference saying that, um, you know, the part of the job in, research is you get the sources and then they don't tell you what you're supposed to say 
and you know you all read these travel narratives and I don't know how the process of trying to figure out what you wanted to highlight about them I don't know if that what that process was like I guess I guess the process of like analyzing what Bryson how Bryson traveled it was interesting because he's just such an interesting person, um, he really likes to describe everything when traveling. Um, and while reading that, I kind of had to pick and choose what I wanted to add to my research because he just said so much about so many different places. I think with looking at my sources, it was kind of difficult at first to figure out what I wanted to pinpoint for the paper. Uh, it was firstly just going to be diving through the expedition itself, but it turned into understanding, like, why is he going on this expedition? Because in his documents, he, he wrote down everything. He had so many books, but he never talked about his grief or anything, and a lot of things happened to him. And so I quickly realized, okay, the primary source is telling one thing, but the secondary sources are telling a different narrative. And so that's kind of when I started digging more into the sources to follow along. Is he actually going for science or is he going for his mental state? And that's kind of the route that it took me through. Um, I guess for me, like, I think trying to determine what exactly to include was sort of an interesting process, I guess, because well, in one of the cases with Robert McClure, the only journal that was published that I could find of his was an edited journal by another explorer, I think Sherard Osborne, I think was his name. And my understanding from historians who've studied the subject is that both Robert McClure and Osborne were both uh, creative in their recounting of uh, some of these journeys they went on. <laughs> And so trying to find, I guess, like the truth in what they talked about, because like the stuff that Perry and, and Amundsen wrote didn't really seem, I mean, they talked about some of their failings and stuff like that. So like it wasn't, it wasn't an especially, like it didn't necessarily paint them in a perfect light or whatever. I mean, it was still sort of positive in their own respect. But um, I guess like, so like the main challenge was just sort of, trying to cut through uh, McClure's narrative a little bit to sort of try to see if any of it sounded not entirely accurate, I guess. But then as far as like finding what to actually include in terms of subject matter, I mean, I think it took me a while to sort of figure out the actual angle that I wanted to approach the paper itself with. But I think once I had sort of an idea of, okay, these are some factors that were kind of commonalities between all these trips, and the captains talked about them a lot of the time. Like, Amundsen had, like, pages of one of his volumes of his journals that was just praising his engine, so that was pretty nice, I guess. Um, so it was sort of, I guess it was, it was sort of a, a, I don't even know how you want to call it, but kind of going back and forth of, Reading the, reading the journals, reading the documents, trying to pick out things that are kind of common throughout them in terms of their experiences, and sort of seeing, I guess, if there's something I could, something interesting I can use to sort of talk about all of them together. And I mean, I, I think it was pretty interesting when I finally finished it, but, um, so yeah, that was, that was, I guess, the process or whatever you want to call it. Well, they all, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to see you know, in all classes, when students write papers, how, you know, you get some kind of an idea, and it begins to evolve, and then all of a sudden you can, you know, realize the significance of something as sort of, okay, this is where I'm going to go with it. Mm -hmm. And, well, um, thanks, panel, for three great papers. <laughs> I, I know Dr. Lichard has plenty to say, but I, I think that we should, you know, just all give her a round of applause on the cheese.